Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Ears for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. Today I'm talking to Geraldine Denning. Geraldine is a senior lecturer at Leicester School of Architecture, De Montfort University. She is also director of Geraldine Denning Architecture and Architects for Social Housing, which she co-founded in response to London's ongoing housing crisis. We talk about her and Simon Elmer's book for a socialist architecture, the meaning of housing and home, and the home's central role in how we engage in society. It really kind of made us sort of think about how the house not only is obviously an individual's relationship to society, how you live, your relationship to your home is absolutely fundamental and critical in the way in which you engage with the world, Mm -hmm. financially, environmentally, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, politically, socially, all those sorts of things. In an environment where all housing is socialised, where everybody has access, to housing regardless of their financial position, you would have a very, very different social structure. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to uh, Geraldine Denning. Geraldine, would you like to introduce Hello. yourself? Hi, uh, yes. Um, I'm an architect um, and a practitioner with my own practice. I also teach architecture at De Montfort University where I'm a senior lecturer um, and I run the professional practice module um, for third year architects. Uh, and I'm also the founder and the co-director of Architects for Social Housing, which is a not-for-profit um, organisation, a community interest company, which was set up in 2015, um, predominantly to address to make a kind of an architectural uh, uh, response to the housing crisis, as we saw it at the time, Um, initially in London, which is where we're based. But uh, as we've seen, it obviously has, you know, uh, ricochets uh, um, elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So so, um, your role in Ash, I think, is possibly, I mean, so your practice itself, Geraldine Denning Architects, isn't it? Um, Mm. and, And you do... Uh, smaller scale mm. stuff or work with commercial people? It's mainly small scale housing. Um, I've done other bits of work, sort of small commercial pieces, um, in, uh, art installations, things like that. But it's predominantly at the moment, it's, it's residential. Um, and in London, again, it's mainly refurbishments and interventions mm. within the kind of existing built fabric. And I mm. think what's interesting is um, to understand a, how important it is to understand the scale of an individual home, you know, what that means to the family and, and the lifestyle of, of architecture on a one-to-one level, knowing how to put something together. And I think the impact that that has in terms of the knowledge that I have gained through that experience, how that then becomes embedded into much larger, you know, when you're working on a, on a kind of an estate mm-hmm. scheme of, of maybe a thousand homes, you still need to understand what it means to, to have a home and a window looking out onto a garden or a view or whatever it is. So I think mm-hmm. there's a, even though those two scales might seem to be diametrically opposed, I think there's still a lot of um, interaction between them. So, but yes, I, predominantly small scale residential. Yeah. I mean, this is a really, really good uh, starting point, I think, because one of the things, obviously most architects, most architecture students end up going into residential or, or, or having a very substantial portion of their, their working life occupied with residential architecture and it's something that you point out in in your in your um book for a socialist architecture which is this idea that that the home or the house Mm. is the critical um framework for producing a more sustainable economically socially environmentally um sustainable um architecture yeah Um, and I kind of like so so I I've been digging around in the the literature around home, and it's very mm. very absent in architecture. Actually, there's very few pieces of writing that try and engage, as you say, with it both as a broader thing, but also in terms of the intimacy of the of the mm. dwelling. Mm, mm. No, no. Well, I think... Sorry, go on. No, no, no. I was just wondering if you could kind of sort of pick around in that. I mean, I think when we started to look. So for Socialist Architecture, it was a series of lectures, came out of a series of lectures that we gave in Vancouver a couple of years ago. And um, we were there for a month and we broke it down into a series of workshops. And we tried to think, okay, how can we structure this uh, event? And we started looking, because they 
there wasn't really a kind of framework for it. And we started to think, okay, let's really try and break this down. So we broke it down into these spheres. So we had the social, the environmental, the economic and the political. And we kind of understood that each of these were ways of looking at and interrogating um, architecture. And looking into a number of these spheres, sort of delving into sort of historically etymology as well, when you look at economy, the oikos um, is about home management, household management. And when you think about the economy, economy isn't about purely financial. You know, when people talk about economies, it's economies of scale. It's about sort of uh, an understanding of the totality of something. Mm -hmm. If something's economic, it necessarily has to engage with a whole range of different issues. It's not a kind of um, uh, uh, separated element. And I think that really started to help us to understand and this oikos, which is the Greek word for, as I say, household management, which is the, the origin of the word economy. But it really kind of made us sort of think about how the house not only is obviously an individual's relationship to society, how you live, mm -hmm. your relationship to your home is absolutely fundamental and critical in the way in which you engage with the world mm -hmm. financially, environmentally. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, politically, socially, all those sorts of things are the primary way. You know, it's obviously for to take a kind of very uh, extreme example. Obviously, if you're homeless, you know, your relationship to the world is absolutely fundamentally, fundamentally different to someone who has a home. And you know, that's mm -hmm. absolutely primary. Uh, and I suppose we would argue, I'm sure other people could argue, you could argue it on an economic level that money is your primary rela relationship to the world or whatever. But, I, you know, we would argue that housing now and this goes on into sort of conversations around the fact that housing is a fundamental political issue. You know, housing, your relationship to your housing is also through your financial situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, in an environment where all housing is socialised, where everybody has access to housing, regardless of their financial position, you would have a very, very different social structure to the one that we see at the moment, whereby your your, your economic situation is almost entirely dictated by your housing situation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're lucky enough to own a home with a reasonably low mortgage, uh, you know, your, your, the rest of your, you know, your, your economic situation is, is, is very, very different to somebody who's really struggling to pay a rent and living in a shared home and, you know, all the sort of consequences that might go with mm -hmm. really, really struggling to pay a ridiculous amount of rent on a, on a, on a rental market. Mm -hmm. I think these are the kind of things that we started looking at in terms of, as you say, the house being your, your, your primary relationship to society. Um, and, and, and therefore, from that, it's, it's sort of its political role, essentially, and obviously it's an economic role. Yeah. Um, I had that kind of. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's th this, this idea. I mean, I, I'm now living in my first purchased house and mm -hmm. I've been as a resident, I think in the t 15 years I've been married, I think we cycled through seven, I think it was seven rental yeah. properties as landlords yeah. closed down or sold off um, uh, the houses beneath us in a way. And that yeah. level of um, connection that you therefore have socially is always very, very tender. And, I, and, and, and we were private renting and I can only imagine for people in social rent under and we'll come to your your project uh, in Saint uh, in in Brenton and the Saint Raphael's estate, where you don't even know you don't even have the sort of the capacity to control that. Mm. There's no way. Must mm. have an absolutely profound effect on the sort of social yeah. and um, yeah. individual well-being of communities. Although I mean, I would say I would argue that actually the private renters are. Aside from if you if if you if you for a second if you don't if you if you if we ignore for a moment the, uh, the sort of um, the housing estate what's happening to the to estates at the moment if we were just to look at historically kind of social housing versus private rented housing, I would argue that the social renters are far more have far more stability. Mm. I mean, you know, you've moved ten times in fifteen years, and you know, it, it's sort of social housing, council housing. You know, a house would be a home for life. And so what you see on the estates that we're working with is, you know, families that are several generations of families that have grown up on that same estate um, and the kind of the, the real close knit communities mm. and the sort of social infrastructures that have have been able to emerge as a result of that. So what you have got uh, on these estates are extraordinarily rich um, communities 
Mm. So, uh, it, yeah, if, if you were to kind of remove the threat at the moment, which is, uh, as you said, which is happening to these estates, which is why we are getting involved, um, in theory, the sort of social housing model um, mm. as a house in which, you know, you're not continually competing with somebody else for a better home or a, just to mm. stay where you are, uh, which is what I would say. So I would argue that the private renters are the people who are who have the hardest time. Mm. Um, and I mean, interestingly, if you look at some of the recent statistics that have come out around what's happened over the last year and a half in terms of the impact that um, the lockdowns and so on have had to the housing um, to, to individuals in different kinds of housing tenures, people mm. who have been most uh, affected have been the private renters, something like um, the overcrowding in private rented homes has doubled. Mm -hmm. in the last year I think it's gone from something like seven percent to fifteen percent um and in a sense I suppose you know our argument comes from a position which is that you know the private rental market is absolutely horrific and social housing should be uh uh uh, you know the uh the absolute um uh a given essentially Mm -hmm. you know and um because the 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 the, yeah that, that, that's, that's kind of a premise of the you know the, the need for social housing because of yeah. the way in which private renters have no uh, purchase in a sense uh, on your community on your local environment you're very much at the whim of your landlord mm. and this and the social housing model to strikes me or the 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 um, deterioration of the social housing model yeah. um i mean for that does social housing is it understood that social housing would almost act as a check if there were if, if there was sufficient quality provision of adequate social housing it would almost act as a break on some of the things that are permitted within the private rental market insofar as landlords couldn't get away with treating people like dirt if mm. people could mm. therefore if they were competing economically with uh, with yeah. local authority provision Yes. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think the fact that they're not competing with that, they're, they're, you know, it's, it's a race to the bottom. I think there's that, that's that phrase. Mm. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, I think in the UK, I think there have been few moments when social housing has done that, you know, and mm. I suppose those kind of the 20 years post-war period um, where having, you know, social housing was the benchmark, essentially, you know, mm-hmm. people would be looking forward to, you know, having a home with a, you know, indoor heat, with, you know, heating and all these kind of amazing facilities that they didn't mm-hmm. have. Uh, and were really providing the homes to aspire to. And it was about, I think at that point, it was about supply. And I think what you're suggesting is that, you know, if there was more social housing, then that, you um, the, the private market could, you know, wouldn't be able to be quite as rapacious. And I think you're absolutely right. They're taking advantage of the situation. I don't think the argument that it's necessarily about purely about supply um, is a very valid one. And that's kind of interesting. When we started doing Ash, we were kind of looking at these kind of myths, sort of myth busting, if you want to call it that, you know, looking at these kind of things. But, well, of course, it's all about supply and demand. So you just need to build more. Um, and when you when you dig into some of those kinds of quite easy uh concepts um and you scratch the surface a little bit you look at it and you kind of think well actually you know in those places where more has been built has that had a direct effect is it this kind of leveling out and what we see the answer to that is no and this comes back to this idea of the economy um and the household and i think we get a lot of kind of politicians talking about oh, well the economy is like household economy you need to balance these things up you have a certain amount of money coming in and a certain amount going out and so on and what we realise is that actually a global economy or a national economy doesn't, or a housing economy doesn't operate like that because it is what we have introduced into that is um, the market, mm-hmm. um, is commodification. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you introduce commodification into what in theory could be, I suppose, a kind of balance of supply and demand, that um, balance is, is suddenly thrown off completely. So what we see is there is more and more produced, but what that does is actually drive up demand um, for housing. So in those areas in London where there's more and more housing being produced, that housing is not suddenly pushing prices down, it's actually pushing prices up. Mm. I mean, there was a very interesting, the, um, there's a concept in uh, motorway development, which came out of, I suppose, the 70s, the sort of green movement, um, which talked about induced demand, um, which was 
So to win everybody the argument in the 70s, well, look, if you made, make motorways wider, we give more roads, that will reduce traffic. And what they observed was actually the opposite was happening. Mm. You know, there'd be an increase in increase in traffic as a result of these widening of roads. So again, it's mm-hmm. kind of the, the, this sort of counterintuitive um, thing going on. And we sort of thought, well, okay, let's have a look and see if we can apply that to housing. And I think, um, I think what we observe is that that is the case. And so I think this idea that you can um, uh, sort of fiddle the market in a way is not uh, um, isn't really working. And so I think this the, the balance between social housing in a capitalist world where ultimately your relationship to housing is driven by the market um, is a, it has always historically in the UK been a difficult one. Um, and I think it's somewhere like Vienna, for example, where you have, I think it's more like 65% of people are living in some form of uh, social housing. That's where we come back to your point about this balance. And I think there, um, the assumption is that social housing is that benchmark. That is what people expect. Those are the standards that are set. And yes, I think in that case, although I think there is still a housing market that that operates alongside it, I think it is less dominant uh, and less um, powerful, I suppose. Mm. So there is definitely, I think, you know, in and now, of course, what we're looking at over the last, what, 20 years, the number of homes, of course, on council estates that are actually social housing in terms of the right to buy has also, we've lost millions of homes that way. Um, so it would be interesting, I think, I can't, don't know the figures off the top of my head, but probably in the 70s, 60s or 70s, there was the largest percentage of people living in some form of social housing. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that's uh, that's also maybe living in a sort of council home, which is a, you know, a terraced house mm-hmm. on a terraced street. Um, But again, that's also about your relationship to housing and um, inequality, essentially, you know, and it's kind of saying, well, actually, you know, if there's a majority, vast majority of people, 30 percent or whatever it is living in socially rented housing, I don't think it ever probably crept up much more than that. If you combine social and council housing. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's and now it's something like 15 percent, you know, so it's quite significantly less. So you're right Mm -hmm. as a sort of as a sort of uh, vocal player in the kind of whole landscape of housing, it's much less um, dominant. Yeah. So the, the, the issue, I mean, what, what, what's interesting for me about architects for social housing is that they are very politically engaged. Hmm. And that is peculiarly to me, um, a rare thing in architectural hmm. practice. Hmm. Um, architecture as an industry, as an enterprise, seems to have absented itself from the debates around, I suppose, what we might call the common good, Mm. Um, which is, which is, I think for students of architecture is always a bit of a, it's a bit of a surprise, because I think a lot Mm. of people come into architecture thinking that they want to do something that's big and bold and designy and arty, but it was also good and they find that it's not i mean do you have any thoughts about why architecture has 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 pursued this, has essentially marginalized itself from mm. the, the 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 most important debates about our cities yeah i mean i think it's really interesting i would argue that yes so if we think back to the time when it was seen to be more political mm-hmm. um you could argue that uh, a much higher percentage of architects were uh, employed in the public uh, the public realm, yeah. whether that's housing, the GLA, housing, schools, hospitals. So again, that welfare state environment, your own, the success of your own um, um, professional career wasn't dictated by uh, money. Mm. And so you had a decent enough salary, which enabled you to live in a decent enough uh, you know, house or whatever. So, and I think the more the sort of neoliberalization of our whole society has meant that now architecture really, I don't know what percentage, I mean, it's, it's a huge, I mean, I don't know what percentage of architects work in the public sector now, it's tiny, you know, it's mm. a few percent. Mm. Um, and so architecture has become, you know, a, a, a commercial practice. Yeah. Um, and by commercial, as soon as you enter into a, a relationship with your work on, on commercial terms, primarily, so as a company, your obligation is to your shareholders mm-hmm. to maximize profit. I mean, that's the basis of a structure of an organization, which is a, a limited company. 
Mm-hmm. If you extrapolate that out to look at how that in, how that translates into the way in which you operate as a practice, um, you know, are you really going to be uh, operating in a way which would um, act in conflict with that? You're, according to the structure of your company, you're not really allowed to. Mm. Um, you know, so what we see is a transition of architects working for the public good, uh, but in an economic relationship. You know, with that, and I think it's important. To, it's important not to sort of think about architecture as a <clears throat> as a sort of as a sort of concept out there. It is a practice. Yeah. Mm. So each of us practices, and our direct sort of re- economic relationship to that practice is intrinsic. I think to what we end up doing. Mm. Um, and I think you know, and I don't think it's anything. I don't think architecture is any different to any other discipline, really, in that respect. You know, um, I think the, the commodity, the, the neoliberalization of our whole society has produced this shift and architecture is one of those that has been carried along with that but I think what's interesting about architecture and again it's not necessarily that different but that it obviously has a kind of symbiotic relationship to that so what you end up seeing is you know architecture producing and architects producing housing which uh, ends up uh, um, sort of uh, pricing themselves out of their own cities, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, so you see this sort of very strange sort of negative cycle going on mm-hmm. where your own practice is actually uh, forging your own chains. Um, mm. and, interesting, and I think, you know, younger architects who are the ones who are most at the brunt of this, who are coming out of university, working for practices, designing these potentially, you know, super high-end um, pieces of architecture, and completely unable to engage with it, you know, with the kind of economics of the city that they're working in. Mm. Um, and, you know, so if you take, so when we were for, when we first started out as architects of social housing, I'll kind of give you an example of this. Um, we were approached by a group of residents to help them with their, to, to counter their, uh, the demolition of threatened demolition of their estate. And this is West Kensington and Gibbs Green estates up in um, West Kensington. And at that time, we were, we'd only just started out and we, we sort of felt like it was such a big scale that uh, we wanted to work with a, an existing architectural practice that had experience of that kind of scale of project. So we approached four or five practices and not one of them who I, I, would, I would argue would consider themselves as being socially engaged, that were working on social housing schemes. Not one of them would take on the project mostly because it would threaten their potential livelihoods. So they were either working already with the the, the council or the developer. And Mm. so they would be seen as going up against Mm. um, the hand that feeds them. Mm. So there's an intrinsic fundamental kind of conflict of interest if you're looking at architecture as a a lucrative business, Mm -hmm. a commercial business, uh, or as a sort of political endeavour. And I think it's... um, very very hard um to manage to make those two things kind of coexist in a way yes it's the genius of the um neoliberal capitalist system as it makes all things to itself i mean it without wishing to be too cynical or too depressing i mean it's even managed to make anti-capitalism a form of uh, a framework for capital yeah um, yeah that's brilliant it is a brilliant system unfortunately and a devastating one yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but you, you mention this idea of the political a lot. And mm. uh, it's sort of endlessly fascinating to me. I mean, how do we define how do we define the political? So mm. in, in your in your book um, uh, for, for a socialist architecture, you, you talk about uh, a different way of understanding s- socialist architecture, which is mm. not predicated on a top-down mm. application of um, rules or so on and so forth. And there's this idea of a, gra- a granular and a ground-up or bottom-up mm. kind of approach. And so I just wondered if you could kind of explain where you see the, the, mm. what the political is in architecture. Mm. How, is an ar- how is architecture political and how is the mm. architect political in relation to that? Mm. I suppose for me, what I mean, what we mean by politic, political is something which negotiates uh, one's position in the world, essentially. Um, And 
so if we look at for a socialist architecture, I think one of the when we were in when we were giving these lectures, uh, one of the questions because there was a couple we were giving them in this sort of workshop, and one of the questions was, you know, do you not see the use of the word socialist as a problem because it's a, it's a historic word and it applies to mm. a sort of historic movement? Mm. And we said, well, you know, we don't believe that the meaning of that word has been uh, uh, kind of um, sullied, as it were. You know, we believe intrinsically that that word has certain meanings which may or may not be wrongly attributed to historic totalitarian regimes. You know, I mean, I would argue that, the, the, and I don't think, you know, for me, for us, socialist is not an authoritarian uh, practice at all. And when you look, when you look back into the sort of origins of the sort of socialist, the sort of Soviet socialist system, it was a de totally decentralized system. Mm. So it would involve local workers groups, for example, getting together, uh, uh, you know, deciding what was best for them. That's how we understood a kind of socialist, if you want, a sort of socialist political system. It was utterly, it was a totally decentralised one, not the kind of centralist uh, sort of behemoth that we, the people I think now uh, uh, sort of impose upon it. I think that's the first thing to say, and I think that then translates into um, the problems that we see with the current system here um, and possible solutions to it, which is about decentralizing, giving more uh, uh, um, sort of, I suppose, power and agency to local groups, to people who understand their, um, uh, uh, you know, the issues that, are surround, that, that, that they're addressing. You know, so if you are, I, I think, yeah, so if you're looking at how do you improve an area, for example, the first people you talk to are the people that live there. You know, I mean, that's an obvious thing to say. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in fact, the way that decisions are being made in the UK doesn't work like that, mm. you know. Uh, and so I think on a very fundamental level, the, you know, yes, we're proponents of decentralization and, um, and about local organization and management of resources in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, and I would argue that's utterly a socialist principle. Mm. Uh, I mean, again, you know, people will have different, everybody now has a different idea of what socialist means. And mm. that does come, so it does come with a lot of baggage, I think. But I don't, mm. I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, our understanding of historic, uh, I mean, you know, being, uh, yeah, the, I think our understanding of uh, concepts does change, you know, so we will have a particular view of, you know, people are now talking about, you know, plenty of people talk about, uh, you know, capitalism as a positive thing. You know, and I'm like, well, I, I don't understand how they can, how that can, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. And so I think the way in which we use language is really, really fundamental to this. Mm -hmm. So the word affordable, for example, to me, um, you know, that word is completely meaningless now yeah. because the way that word is used in, within kind of policy, you know, is something which is not affordable. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of, there's this kind of, we, we use this phrase of looking glass concept, this looking glass world where, the things that have purported so regeneration is actually means now demolition mm -hmm. you know so the, the, the meaning of these words is always in flux it's very slippery and who controls what the we like, i can't use the word affordable now in any meaningful way because that word has been kind of co-opted mm. um, and so to some extent like with the word socialist I'm like well you know actually we can take that word back and define how we understand it to mean not necessarily just um cast it away in the kind of annals of history if we believe that it still has a real relevance um, and uh, you know it's a very simple word actually it's just social with this on the end of it it's not a complicated word and I don't think you know anybody can claim to say well I know exactly what this means it's like well actually these things are always um, uh, interpreted mm. uh, and we have an interpretation of it and we've also applied that in you know in this in this kind of book and series of lectures to a practice and so if you go and you look at sort of yeah, the origins of, uh, of socialism, it was practice based. You know, mm. it was about uh, um, processes that led to things that were, you know, that, and I think that's very much how we understand. That's also how we understand political action. Mm -hmm. Politics for us is not about waiting for two to for four years and putting an X in the ballot box. It's actually something that happens every day. So every decision that you make, whether it's in your practice or your daily life, will have, I mean, you know obviously to some with some flexibility will have sort of political consequences mm -hmm. um and certainly the bigger decisions that you make have significant ones collectively mm -hmm. um, and i think part of what we're trying to i suppose encourage people to do is firstly to realize that that primarily you know we talk about socialist architecture and what we also talk about is 
capitalist architecture, which is 99.9% of what we see mm-hmm. going on at the moment is, you know, could easily be or should maybe be prefaced with the word capitalist. If we mm-hmm. understand capitalism as something which is uh, profiting off um, uh, production, somebody else's yeah. production. Somebody else's labor. You know, that's how we understand capitalism is fundamentally uh, the production of uh, profit from others' labor on on a very, very simple level. Um, And that is that is what we're seeing in 90 percent of our architecture. And I said before, I think what's what's interesting now is that we're seeing that that looping back so that what we're Mm -hmm. producing is not just like advertising, for example, which could be understood as a purely capitalist kind of activity. Mm-hmm. Architecture is then reproducing the environment and it's reproducing inequality. You know, so it's actually making, it's not just observing or kind of commenting on the world, it's making it significantly worse. <laughs> yeah, I think, this is, um, I think this is a really interesting point. It's something that, so you, you, this idea that architecture has the capacity to be efficacious, to do a thing. Yes. It also has yeah. the capacity to do the bloody opposite of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And exactly. you talked about this yeah. idea of, 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 yeah, socialism. The word is social. Mm. Mm. And it brings us back to this idea of homes. So the way that a home can make um, social behavior mm. more likely to occur, not only in the kind of grander sense of things like in the mm. citywide or the master plan or even even the kind of council estate on, on a big scale mm. but even in the intimacy of the interiority in the the design of the actual spaces of the home and so socialist architecture historically or more socially orientated architecture has have focused around that, those ideas mm. haven't they of, yes, of producing environments that domestically individually precipitate social behavior Absolutely. I mean, I think so, you know, if you're looking at the sort of early uh, uh, Russian architecture, for example, in the 20s and 30s, and then German uh, sort of Weimar uh, architecture, the early modernists essentially was also had that very much, and not all of it, but there was for certainly a kind of social, I would say, vision, if not a socialist mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or rather, I think a lot of people probably, a lot of the architects wouldn't necessarily have seen themselves as overtly as socialists or as communists, or although, mm-hmm. although a lot of them would have done. And I think understanding that absolutely the relationship of the individual home um, to the collective was really at the heart, I think, of people's understanding of architecture. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you say, that starts from the home. And you know, if even if you bury even deeper, so you'd look at even like they say the um at the Narconflin building, which is one of the earliest examples, you know, where we see these kinds of uh, the home in almost cracked open, essentially. So the whole building becomes a home where the sort of individual functions, as it were, the social activities are uh, even are, are more socialized. So that you know, the kitchen, uh, the plate, the eating, you know, facilities, mm-hmm. the living spaces are kind of extracted and are uh, yeah socialized. And I mean, what's kind of interesting is that we're now seeing those things happening uh, in a capitalist sense so we're seeing what was the, the, these places like the collective um and so we're seeing an argument now being made for uh, a kind of uh, on an economic level i would argue people are saying well actually you know do we all really need a kitchen in every in every home if all you're, if, if you're not eating at home all the time mm-hmm. uh, so there's an economic argument i think which is now being made uh, for places for more collective living for co-housing mm-hmm. um and i think there are some quite interesting um, experiments going on there. Uh, I mean, we worked with a co-housing group up in Walthamstow, which is a small uh, example. It's sort of 10 or 11 people living in a, in a collectively living in a house and they were a housing co-op and they were looking at expanding. Um, and it became very interesting to think about, again, this goes back to this issue of, you know, understanding these things on this very small scale. Um, how do people live together? And it was, complex you know I mean they would have a meeting every week really to discuss issues that had come up you know um, a lot of energy was spent on managing that shared space Mm. but the benefit was they ended up having you know each individual would have have access to a much larger amount of varied space Mm -hmm. than your average person would in a single home Mm. so you know we were looking at you know there's a possibility of having a kind of music room and a cinema room and all these kinds of things which you can gain if you if you if, if you understand the whole the home as much larger entity mm. so and even in for example on, on council estates uh to a lesser degree but you know each estate 
used to, or still now, some of them do have a, a, a you know a community hall, mm-hmm. and that hall is available to be shared and to be rented out. So you get people in there with a you have a party for a hundred people, or so the activities or, or meetings or whatever you, you know whatever. You, so there's a kind of there's a, there's a, a, an opportunity for something which you wouldn't have if you just had a little two bedroom flat, which wasn't part of a larger kind of social structure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's quite interesting this this idea. So thinking about some say, emblematic instances of perhaps what we might see as more so- socially orientated or more socialist housing uh, architecture in the UK, places like Park Hill Estate by the Smithsons. Um, I always think Park Hills by the Smithsons. It is, isn't it? Um, or is it Sheffield City yeah. Council? Anyway, um, <laughs> I don't think it was. No, no. Smithson. I, I, you're going to have to get me to check. I can't, I can't believe anyway, it. You know that. that kind of those those big tower, those big yeah. kind of streets in the sky, that kind of brutalist yeah. architecture, ha, has at its basis a logic of socialization, which actually, I don't know. Maybe this is maybe this is untrue, but it seems to me to be based on a kind of Victorian industrial housing model of trying to replicate the social uh, the sociality mm. of actually industrial. Uh, Again, so just as socialism has become appended to a lot of things that it doesn't really, I think, I feel like yeah. capitalism, as we experience it now, is a radically different thing to even what the Victorians were performing. Oh, totally. Oh, completely. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and, so, and, so, and so that housing that my grandparents were raised in, you know, red brick terraced housing, and, and this house I'm in at the moment is a 1904 workers' cottage, workers' mm. terrace, sorry. Um, mm. uh, they, they, the, the socialist housing that comes in the post-war period and that we still, I suppose, advance seems to have its roots in a typology which is really embedded in kind of industrialization and radical exploitation of the Victorian period. Yes, I mean, I, I think there's, 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 there's several different routes into the modernist housing estate and I think what you the example you give at uh, Park Hill is a really good one because that was deliberately trying to recreate the the kind of the street yeah. in the sky um, and I think um, and essentially you could also argue that Le Corbusier you know in, ter- in the Unité was also doing the same thing you yeah. know very wide very generous social spaces which encouraged people to hang to linger around you know that uh, uh, you know, those were the things that really uh, significantly uh, characterised, in a way, yeah. that yeah. thinking. Um, so, yes, on one level, I think it was doing that. Um, I think, in a way, again, looking at this way that housing is produced as a result of a certain set of decisions and processes and ideas and ideologies, it then also has effects and those things, it, it's then a sort of, yeah, as I say, this sort of cyclical process. And for example, now the kind of, I mean, I, live, I happen to live and work here on, I'm on the ninth and 10th floor of a tower block. And the social what, activity- the Balfour Estate? Are you in the Balfour Estate? No, 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 I'm in a got, it's Cotton Gardens. Uh, it's in South London, it's, there's three tower blocks. Um, it's a brutalist estate by an architect called George Finch. And it's, um, it's a uh, beautiful, uh, so you know it's it's amazing. It and and say so we've got this this kind of extraordinary view of of sort of central London, and the social activity that goes on here, um, I would say primarily happens in the lifts, mm-hmm. and they're quite slow. The lifts, you know, up you go, and you have just enough time in a lift to exchange a little pleasantry a little chit chat or something but not too long for it to become awkward so you're like all right you know talking about the weather or whatever these kind of very very little in passing things but you know I'd say I know and like we've probably got I think there's about 80 flats in the block and I would say I probably know half the people in this block I've been here a significant period you know I've probably been here about 13 14 years so it's a decent amount of time and a lot of the children I've seen grow up and um and there's also there's also a mez, what's called the mezzanine. So it's a kind of podium on which these three blocks sort of sit. Mm. And originally there was actually a um, a children's play space designed for the for the top of that space. Mm. That then got removed. I think in the eighties or so there was a kind of a bit of a, 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 a some reworking done to this space, and there was a um, community centre put there instead. Um, and there's recently there's been kind of calls to stop children playing in that on this mm-hmm. podium 
which again is this kind of what well, that this is the this is this fantastic safe space for kids, mm-hmm. young kids mm-hmm. with their little scooters playing around, getting to know each other. Um, would be in theory this perfect space for that, but yeah, there's there's a sort of strange desire. Those those spaces are kind of contested, I suppose, and I think that's something which comes out of a lot of these. Um, shared space schemes yeah. where that's yeah. that, that that space that is shared you know how is it managed you know mm-hmm. how is it and I think that comes through time I think interestingly um because that that kind of space is certainly in the UK it's quite a new spatial form in somewhere like I mean I would imagine somewhere like Germany or Berlin where you're, you're these you know sort of central European cities where you know, even the Victorian housing was, you know, uh, uh, large city blocks with shared space, shared courtyard space, Mm -hmm. that shared space, the knowledge about how to live and use that shared space is something which is much more embedded, I think, socially and culturally Mm -hmm. within their their culture. Which I think I mean, it's, us- it's the same in Scotland. I mean, in Glasgow and Edinburgh, they have the tenement typology with a, with a you know, perimeter block with a, with a shared yeah. courtyard. And, and, and yeah. I lived in one for, for a number of years. Um, and what was interesting is watching how this transformation of home. Yeah. The first, the first place we lived in was a convent, uh, an ex-convent. And the big shared courtyard was shared by the nuns and all the residents in the in the area. This is in the West End of Glasgow, so it's fairly well to do historically, um, and beautifully made. And yeah. unlike the social lift, they have the social close, which is the staircase yeah. going up, uh, which yeah. is really an extension of the street. But it's a it's a halfway yeah. house between the street and and the, and the domestic. But as the house became transformed into a commodity, mm. the the mm. demands on that social space both fell. People didn't share. And mm. then when they wanted it, they put a fence up. So these great, yeah. big, beautiful courtyards were suddenly yeah. starting to be demarked mm-hmm. by very territorial behavior. And I think that's something that perhaps is, you know, when we look at co-housing, so you talk about co-housing up in Waltham, yeah. it's a real challenge because you have to have communities of common perception or common values yeah. 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 to enable it to happen at all. Whereas yeah. what seemed to happen in the post-war period is that Maybe it was the trauma of the war. Maybe it was um, the trauma of post-industrialism or the, the emergence of post-industrialism, where people seemed to want to participate together. Mm. Mm. You don't seem to be wanting to do that at the moment. So you're, you're, the fight of ash is a very complex one insofar as yeah. the, the social tide seems to be against you. Yeah. Can I just, I'm just realising my window's open and the rain is pouring in. So hold on a second. <laughs> Sorry, there's a there's a gale. There's a gale out there. Oh, it's lovely um, and sunny. It's lovely and sunny here, which is why I'm being <laughs> paraskuro to pieces. I, I kind of love being again, like you know, I love being up here, and you're in the you know the weather. All types of weather is 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 kind of amazing when you're up this high. You see it coming in, and yeah. you're buffeted around by the in a way that you you know yeah, I I love it. Um, but yeah, so you were saying about the change in relationship to to one space. Well, it's just, it's, just, it's just the way that this political dynamic, and it's something yeah. that I would like to go on to, that this change yeah. in the political dynamic has tra- has transformed housing into commodity. Yes. And, it, yeah. and, it, and it's... But not I just think, housing. I think, and again, that extended space is commodified. And I think mm-hmm. we, one of the projects that we did before Ash was set up, actually, was, was it's a kind of extended project called Geopoetry. Mm-hmm. And we would pick certain kind of philosophical texts or theoretical texts and or poetry or whatever, we would read them in particular places. And um, we were reading... Um, 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 William well, Blake? No, 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 <laughs> no, you've seen the painting behind me. No, um, uh, not Lefebvre, I'm thinking of... Sorry, this is the bit you're gonna have to edit out. <laughs> no, I'm not editing this out, this is good. <laughs> Just having my... Um, um, oh, maybe it is Lefebvre, the production of space. Yes, yeah. I think it is, in fact. Um, and, yeah, talking about how, yes, as you say, this relationship to space has moved from one from place, which is one of sort of uh, historic uh, um, and uh, meaning. And a place is something which has meaning, has, has kind of activities and in, in is, is a social place mm-hmm. to a concept of space which is something which is measured quantifiable and sold 
Mm-hmm. And I think that a, a kind of this shift in understanding, and I don't think it's necessarily happened very quickly. This has been going on for, you know, a hundred years, I suppose. And it's, I think this is the capitalist shift, essentially, mm-hmm. from an understanding of place, the importance of a place which has social networks, it has a whole range of meanings and functions ascribed to it, to uh, the space which is yeah, simply a quantifiable amount which can be measured uh, and sold. And its only uh, value, its only quality is its financial exchange mm-hmm. value. Um, and that shift, which I think he talks about very well, is, uh, is very much that. Um, this kind of conceptual shift that I think, as you say, that means that even people living in social housing, maybe because it's, it, it's a collective shift, I think. Mm-hmm. It's not an individual one. Collectively, as a culture, um, we all, you know, culturally, we, we, that's how people see the world now uh, mm-hmm. as something which needs to be contained and hold held on to you know mm-hmm. uh, if something is being lost and i think that's a kind of culture of fear as well you know um and i think the in, you know increase in equality increases one's perception of what you have versus what somebody else has mm-hmm. um and all those kind of things psychologically don't create a, a, a possibility for shared for sharing well it's, it's interesting isn't it because so marx talks about the the idea of um alienation Mm. Um, and, you know, political theorists discussing and, and philosophers discussing the idea of modernism, because modernism is something that you defend. And I think that's, I mean, it's easy to defend. It's aesthetically quite nice to look at, I always find. Um, and you, you, you said, to quote your book, modernism has been denigrated by neoliberalism. But mm. I, I wonder whether actually, so Peter Berger in his book, um, Facing Up to Modernity, and Arendt talks about it in The Human Condition, Marx talks about it, but, you know, everybody's talked about it. This idea at the heart of modern modernization, which we see, I think, in modernist architecture, is the idea of, in, of isolation and alienation. And that what, we, what capitalism or neoliberal capitalism capitalism has done has simply articulate that into a they've used that as a device for commodifying mm. humans so we have this, sure. go on i'm not sure that i i'm not sure i agree you said that uh, modernism creates a, a, a sense of alienation and um isolation Is that oh, what you mod- said? Mo- well modernity modernity as a paradigm yes starting in what 15 yeah Starting for, for Aaron to Mark, starting at the Protestant Reformation in in in, in yeah. Britain, but but perhaps um, in art and architecture, perhaps starting in the eighteen fifties, where they take this idea yeah. of the individuated human being and use it, yeah, yeah, to instrumentalize people. Yes, I totally agree. But I suppose I would argue that the modernist movement in architecture was, I mean, okay. I don't know how aware it was of that, of those processes. I would say very aware because, you know, we're also looking at that as the period when, uh, uh, you know, the arts and crafts movement was coming up. So there was an awareness of the alienation of, um, you know, man from its products of its labour and, and that sort of thing. And I do, and I think so when we look at the architecture which is produced, yes, you can see it as a, as a sort of alienating um, uh, uh, sort of uh, device, but at the same time, I, I think the architects that were designing those spaces were, were designing them from social principles. That actually these are spaces which will come together. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think that's in, so. I think it's interesting. I, I'd agree with you that there's a there's a capacity for those spaces to become commodified, which is what they've done. But I think mm-hmm. anything has a capacity for commodification. I think it's kind of as you say, even you know, anarchism. You can buy an anarchist T-shirt. You know, so it's like that anything has anything can be commodified. But I, I mean, I suppose I would hope. And the the socialist architects of that period, so George Finch, for example, who designed this block, the drawings that he made um, of the interiors of the spaces were absolutely beautiful. And, you know, the the space themselves haven't changed at all. They're all the same. They're all two story maisonettes and they're all identical. There's 240 of them. Um, And so my my flat looks exactly as his drawing, you know, described probably just a slightly different kitchen or whatever. Um, and, you know, I think that was when they did have a social vision. There was a social vision. And I don't think this is, this is a modernist piece of architecture, but I don't think um, I would think he would understand 
the idea of the alienating potential for uh but then I, 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 yeah, I suppose, are you suggesting that there are other forms of architecture which, so let's say the terrace house is not an alienating, that somehow there is something fundamental or intrinsic to modernist architecture that is alienating. I would actually argue that maybe that's a framework of, that's a way of thinking which we've been taught to think. Uh, and actually in a way, if you think about the, 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 the individual Victorian house with all of its quirks and all of its individuality, uh, and yet you may think of that as a kind of positive thing because it's about truth materials and it enables, you know, there's a sort of um, the materiality of it is somehow feels like there's an individuality to it. But then I would argue, is that not also sort of a, a part of that commodification more so, in fact, mm-hmm. so that the, you know, the more beautiful one Victorian house is, you know, that, that's, a sort of, that's a two million pound house. Although I think we've been encouraged to believe that the Victorian house, just for example, or whatever, is less of a, an alienating mm. architectural device. I don't know. These, you know, I'm thinking off the top but of my no, head. No, I, I'm, I'm, I just think that, that this idea of, so another one of these things that Peter Berger points out is this idea of abstraction that's inherent to the modern project. And you see it most Mm. clearly in Mm. in Corbusier and in in international modernism, where there's a universalist idea about, you know, le modular, the the, the Mm. ideal man, and it is a man, um, apparently based around the proportions that uh, Corbusier understood James Bond to have. Um, Really? Yeah, six foot tall, uh, 1.85 or something, uh, (laughs) 1.82 meters. Uh, well, you know, urban myths and all of that, but um, uh, this idea that there is a kind of, uh, like the, the Vitruvian man, there's this idea well, you're, designing, say, you're designing just to mm. capital M mankind, very much like this idea of the masses. And what mm. you seem to be suggesting, and we might talk about your St. Raphael's project here, is this idea that we need to escape this abstraction that's almost inherent to modernism to get back down into the into the ground into the reality of everyday life hmm. and that hmm. the home is the principal and most excellent device for doing that of of really considering people as persons as individuals i would argue that what you are suggesting is actually so far beyond modernism as hmm. we understand it from the history books and 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 as it's presented to us in our kind of collective imagination that, we, that you're looking at something that's totally different. Okay. Maybe. But I mean, if you were to look at, for example, Central Hill Estate, uh, which is one of the ones that we worked on um, a few years ago, that was the first, first time we did a big kind of uh, a proposal for an alternative to demolition. Uh, so architecturally, that is fascinating. Uh, and again, it would certainly, I think, fall within the modernist kind of uh, um, uh, um terminology yeah but it's 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 very steep it's built right it's built on a hill outside yeah. of london it's built in crystal palace very very steep and so the the landscape it's more like a, a you know an italian hill town yeah you've got these little pedestrianized streets it's very low rise yeah. uh it's kind of two to three stories most of it and it's absolutely it, its relationship with its environment and its landscape is extraordinarily subtle and it's a piece it's absolute work of genius but it's absolutely modernist and i would say the modernism uh, yes, the, the, the architecturally, uh, the forms are uh, relatively abstract, so they're quite blocky. There's very little, there's very little, I suppose you could say, uh, uh, detail. Well, there's detailing, but there's very little kind of excess, let's say. Mm. Um, there is, the, the materials are expressed. So there's a kind of whole series, whole range of things which you would tick these boxes. So yes, it's clearly a modernist estate. But also there's, a, there's the things which I would say the sort of socialist side of the modernist are about quality of views. Mm-hmm. So each of the flats, you have these maisonettes, the one goes up, one goes down, but they both have a view yeah. of the city. So, uh, uh, you know, and the, 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 the landscape and its relationship to the landscape is not one, it is a really close one, which I think a lot of people probably also wouldn't see. They sort of think of modernism as this thing that you can just you pick it up and you can plonk it, this international modernism, mm-hmm. essentially. It's this thing you can take and plonk around all around the world and it doesn't really respond to its its environment. So mm-hmm. again, this one up in Central Hill isn't that at all. It's mm-hmm. very, very sensitive to its environment. And I think, like I was saying before, comes more out of the sort of Scandinavian uh, movement. Rosemary Sternstedt, who was the lead architect on that, 
uh, I think was um, Scandinavian. Um, and that was a different kind of modernist path, one which was, uh, I think, in a way, much more uh, sensitive maybe to the political, uh, well, sorry, the, the particular local conditions, whether they are you know, environmental uh, or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I think there are different strands of modernism that I think I personally think are probably more successful on in terms of creating a sort of social uh, environment, because I do think that the social environment is the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it, it's an environment uh, which is a physical space. It's something which is which you occupy physically. Mm -hmm. um, and that does then have a relationship to things like light and but also to the landscape and to the surrounding area. So, again, it's about, well, OK, how do we embed? How does this piece of architecture relate to the surrounding area? And, and one of the kind of criticisms of modernism, you know, again, the international kind of style was that, well, actually, again, this is not necessarily relating to its immediate environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are criticisms. I mean, definitely, I'm not suggesting that all modernist architecture is fantastic at all. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would also say, having said that, I think that um, the argument also that, oh, well, that's not a very good piece of architecture, so it demands, should be torn down, mm -hmm. I would think is also, because of, you know, architecturally, when an architect goes into an estate demolition project, one of the many things that they say is that architecturally the estate has, um, you know, significant design flaws that can't be uh, removed. And so therefore the demolition of the estate is based on architectural and I would say sort of aesthetic reasons. Um, and we haven't come across a single estate that we've worked with. And they've been very varied in terms of the different styles and ages and periods of estates that we've worked on. There's never been an estate whose layout, master plan, design cannot be uh, improved um, with some, you know, with minor um, improvements, refurbishments, interventions and so on. Yeah. So I think, again, that argument that, that modernist architecture has fundamental design flaws, which is an argument which is used for the demolition, so places like the Aylesbury, for example, mm -hmm. um, and the Haygate and so on. For us, uh, you know, housing... As a as an economic um, as an economic entity, so my relationship to my housing, uh, or my relationship to the world through my housing as a, as an economic uh, entity is so important um, that whether or not you like the design of it, and this is not going to sound very architectural, but for us the sort of social content of those buildings is more important than. Uh, an architectural uh, position which may or may not change in like within the course of a lifetime yeah. you know I mean yeah. people's people's opinions about Victorian architecture you know was like oh my god what an eyesore tear it down you know I mean and, and you know and every movement to, immediately after its movement has there's a kind of backlash and people like to tear things down so I mean I think we need to be very very careful when we are critiquing periods um, and you know there will be a lot of people that will be devastated you know have been like, oh, how on earth could we have allowed that to happen yeah you know how on earth could we have allowed certain you know kind of like extraordinary victorian buildings to be torn down how on earth could but that is an act of an ideological act so when a, when a new ideology moves in part of that it requires the demolition of the previous one and so i think the, de the denigration of whatever social housing we have left is part of an ideological yeah. shift, not just ideology, but practically get rid of them because they are the places where, uh, you know, kind of social activity actually still used to go on. Like, so for mm -hmm. example, the, the community hall that sits in the middle of the council estate used to be a place where people could actually come together and discuss the issues, the, you know, collective issues. But what's happening now is those community halls are getting destroyed whether they're becoming places that you have to pay for to use and therefore financially are without, you know, out of the reach of most of the local residents or are literally being demolished to build something else. So again, the spaces where collective action, political action, dare I say, you know, could take place are being removed. Um, so it's not only, so there's ideologically a kind of uh, destruction uh, uh, sort of, um, on a kind of an ideological sense, but, but actually and practically we're destroying the, the places which could have enabled that, that those activities to take place. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's where, I mean, it's something, a point that I sprung to mind earlier uh, when you were talking earlier, this idea that 
the, the home is the significant device that enables social activity. And I think that that's absolutely true. And the way that that embattled quality of the domestic is also mirrored in the embattled quality of the urban. So we have urban realm that is increasingly commodified yeah, um, yeah. and increasingly um, actually policed, literally yeah. policed absolutely. by private commercial interest yeah. um, to, to disable mm. Mm. social action. And, um, and, and it's, it, it, is, it, is, it is a huge challenge. But uh, your, your book, you talk about these four, uh, in, in your lectures, you talked about these four aspects, the social, the political, the environmental, and the economic. And I think your points stand for themselves in terms of that, that we have this kind of, we have an obligation to engage, for example, in St. Raphael's estate in Brent, because the approach that's being proposed for the for the uh, regeneration of St. Raphael's is to erase it and then yeah. put in people with gigantic salaries. Yeah. Um, and on all of those different, on all of those four uh, components, uh, you are arguing that we need to kind of reappraise our approach to historic mm -hmm. environments. Mm -hmm. So the social, as you say, we, we have to kind of recognize the social fabric that these places support and the architecture mm -hmm makes that socialization, that sociality more likely to occur. Um, I think this issue of environment, so I'm really interested in socialist architecture and environmentalism and that mm. kind of mm. next between those two things. Yeah, you see, I mean, the, the, this idea that, I mean, again, historically, socialism wasn't associated with an environmental movement, but I mean, yeah. that's, that's just because there wasn't a, a strong environmental movement at that time, I suppose. And I mean, for us, uh, you know, I don't, you cannot separate. I mean, in a way, the, the book was about, again, it was about looking at these four different uh, uh, kind of spheres, as it were, but, but recognising that they are absolutely inseparable from each other. Mm. So, you know, for us, the idea of separating the environment from the social seems to be a kind of impossible task, actually. So, I mean, when we're looking at, let's look at the sort of a very broad, very huge kind of environmental um, issues. So let's say, you know, uh, flooding, or, uh, uh, you know, we're about the, the climate crisis, whatever you want to call it, um, who is affected most by those things? The poorest people. Yeah, they're the ones who are living in conditions which are uh, right on the edge of what is possible. So the places in the world which are the most fragile are the people who have the least ability to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be supported in those conditions. Yeah? So for us, the environment is a fundamentally social issue without, without a shadow of a doubt. Mm. Um, when we were in Vancouver, what was very interesting, they talked about shade because, I mean, they have a kind of heat over there, as we know now from the from the wildfires. You know, shade is an economic issue. For, you know, to, you, you kind of have to purchase shade, you know, the part, you know, places which don't have trees, for example. So, again, mm -hmm. if you were to, you know, walking around the sort of what you would deem to be a kind of luxury areas will environmentally have already, you know, much better uh, physical environments mm. um, and those two things work absolutely uh, uh, hand in hand and so I think I mean the argument that we make in St Raphael's a sort of environmental argument um, I think essentially we've always understood that there is an environmental um, uh, uh, issue there uh, on a very on 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 the kind of very abstract level in terms of the, the, what we look at in there um, is the embodied carbon very specifically um, partly we're sort of saying, look, there are so many different ways in which this is wrong. Let's take an example. Let's take the embodied carbon, for example, and look at, uh, uh, you know, if we are now, if Brent Council, if the GLA, if, you know, if we're now, what is it, COP26 this year, if we collectively as a, uh, as a, as a, as a country are saying, we need to do something about this. And yet, on the other hand, are proposing uh, to demolish uh, uh, 760 homes and rebuild them in a way which which produces, I think it was about four times or uses more four times more embodied carbon than our proposal would. That doesn't make sense environmentally, just on a simple on the numbers basis, you know, because again, the environment in that sense is being reduced to numbers, because I think our capitalist system understands numbers better than it does. People saying, well, actually having a tree or being near a piece of green space is really beneficial mm -hmm. socially. Um, we understand things in numbers, and I think certainly things like councils, you can start to, numbers start to mean cost. I mean, and I think 
increasingly we're going to be starting to see you know whether it's about carbon taxes or whatever people are starting to equate you know things like the environment with financial costs um it's a shame that that's the way in which people have to you have to make those translations in order for people to understand the value but i think that's because again going back to the sort of structure of companies if you're thinking on behalf of a company uh, and even i would argue that maybe you know the british parliament is a sort of a, as an organizational structure um needs to see things in these very simple terms um i mean it was interesting so on st raphael's it's also right by a river um the brent river um and brent river park in neighboring uh, ealing is a conservation area so they've obviously you know really invested in it they've recognized the value of this little river uh, and it's and it's kind of social as well and economic uh, sorry and environmental um qualities but neighboring brent where we are um it's not a conservation area it's not understood as having any real environmental or social uh, properties you know if there's a lovely little stream little river mm-hmm. by the side of a park you know that's where i'd be going to have a picnic you know you can imagine that this is also again about creating a, a, a really welcoming environment for, mm-hmm. for social activity to take place um and so again part of the argument looks at that and looks at well you know yeah we need to increase the biodiversity we need to understand that these existing uh, ecosystems that will have grown up around this and in parts it's quite scruffy little place you know mm. it's not this kind of very neat carefully looked after but the wild wildlife in the city needs we need those spaces you know and mm. i think increasingly but again you know those spaces can't be uh, commodified you know that's the, they're the opposite because they it's wildlife and you can't commodify wildlife unless you you know i mean i suppose if you call it a conservation area or a wildlife park then you can um so i think it goes again about the, the you know the, the how you commodify something and you know that little park with you know the fact that it'll be it'll be a perfect what they call it's called a green corridor mm. uh you know which enables wildlife and all sorts of things to move along it and down mm. it and they're absolutely crucial for the kind of uh, biodiversity and the, uh, the the ecology of a city to to thrive um and yeah so that's another argument for again for sort of you know for retaining the 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 existing sort of urban environment that's there because that urban environment is not simply concrete it's it's a whole load of other stuff mm. uh from back gardens and mm-hmm. um things that have been there for you know for years but that have really embedded themselves in and i think those things are not valued you know mm. it's understood a developer comes along looks at it and sees the square meterage and they're like right okay that's a kind of kaching we can make this much money out of it and there is no other voice that really makes any dent into into that you know that debate no and it, it's something that i've thought and encountered a lot uh, in in academia and in practice that we, which is that of course the planning system itself again coming back to this kind of structural issue of governance is that the planning mm. system itself is incentivized towards um redevelopment mm. knocking down yeah. and 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 for sale housing because of course uh of the section 106 agreement which gives quite substantial quantities of money to local authority officials i mean i've literally also- had i've literally had a a county councillor so a borough councillor admit that to mm. me in to my face and i said what like what do you mean and 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 he gave sort sort of some figures about how much of an s106 agreement would actually be trousered by through consultation mm. with councillors and i said i said to them if that was zimbabwe we would call that corruption uh, and yeah. and they said i guess we would and yeah. and that was it yeah yeah and i think I, the thing is the corruption is deemed to be a a, a healthy system gone wrong but the fact is the corruption is so embedded in the system yeah, that yeah. it's you can't really even call it corruption it's just it's just the system is fundamentally flawed i think yeah, that's yeah. and that's where we come back to this in a sense this 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 you know primary political you know that the capitalist the system which we're talking about the capitalist system is the one which is which is making all these exceptions and all these rules and mm. and they are absolutely i mean you know just another one to give you an example which is the vat you know there's no vat on a new build but there is vat on a refurbishment mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so again, where is the incentive? I mean, that has been an argument that's been made for quite vociferously for quite a few years. Mm-hmm. Um, and it may now that the, I think now the uh, the environmental argument is being harder and harder, I think, to ignore. Things like that, you know, the, the refurbishment uh, and the coming off the refurbishment may well, may change in the next mm. couple of years through really persistent lobbying. Um, um, because that utterly shifts, you know, I mean, and I think these things, we, we can't really ignore them because they are embedded in the system. And if they, and if they make a significant financial difference, then it's obviously what you're going to choose. People are not going to choose the option, which is significantly more expensive. Uh, well, they can't, it's they not can't really afford to. I mean, the power to do that. Yeah. That's what I mean. I don't think, and it's not necessarily about saying that individuals are bad people, because ultimately, you know, if you have a company and your company premise is to maximise, you know, for shareholders, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm not blaming individuals. I mean, this, the structure, it means that, you know, if you were to go against that, you would effectively be, you'd be kind of mad. You know? <laughs> and in a sense, the kind of work that we're doing, you know, we will never be able to make this financially viable what we're doing because it's kind of crazy, you know? Um, and that's, that's a problem indivi- on an individual level. Mm. Um, but it's because the structure of the system does not, does not allow it. You know? yeah. um, so you, as I say, I'm not blaming individuals, but I do think individuals don't are, are, seem to be quite happy with the way it goes. So, you know, there are opportunities to push against it. Um, and I think people don't, you know, if things are kind of going okay, it's like, well, actually, you know, let's just not rock the boat, you know. And I realise that I'm doing some things which may not be that great, but la 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 la, pretend that that's okay. I don't have a choice. My hands are tied. All the sorts of things that the councillors say, and and if you do, you know, when you do confront architects, that we, which we have done, you know, in terms of their uh, uh, the schemes that they've worked on and the consequences of them, they will come up with very plausible arguments you know and you know including things like well you know i have to pay my um the wages of my staff so you know and that's there's a sort of sort of they think there's a kind of moral obligation that they have to be a, a successful financial uh, entity you know so that weighed against you know a kind of political ethics is um you know well there's, there's not really any there's very little question there i mean one of the one of the things we've sort of talked about in terms of the environment, environmental, which it shouldn't just be about the environment, because the environment is now such an issue. People seem to be more interested in the environmental consequences, demolitions, and the social ones. That's not our position, but you no, know, um, it shouldn't be, for example, the individual, uh, you know, interests of an individual client, for example, as to whether or not they do something which has a significant environmental impact mm. on other people. So it shouldn't be down to a kind of what's deemed sort of an ethical choice on the part of the architect or the client, you know, the client on the whole, whether or not to do something. That's where legislation has to come in. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's where and essentially, I think the sort of the sort of um, what was that organisation called? The the red tape committee or something, this sort of the neoliberal idea of taking the hands off, you know, let's just, we don't like red tape because red tape gets in the way of innovation and so on. So let's just deregulate. Um, and, you know, and what happens then? You get Grenfell Tower, you know, and, and the point about Grenfell is that it's not an exception. It's absolutely, as we've seen with how many, how many hundred other tower blocks, buildings and so on clad in exactly the same way. So it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, it's the rule. You know, mm-hmm. so I think, but the deregulation has been the, you know, that's what neoliberalization has also brought in. And mm-hmm. so I did, well, you know, individuals will make their choices, and but, but the decision, the consequences of the decisions that are made by those individuals are huge and collective decisions. Mm-hmm. And that's where, that's where government has to, has to start stepping in. Um, and I mean, that, yeah, essentially, I suppose a lot of the work that we're doing is trying to, um address policy you know is trying to and i I think interestingly uh, i mean it's very difficult always to see whether there have been direct impacts of your work you know what i mean this case this is a very complex sort of systems but i mean the gla for example last december so december 2020 made a significant change to their funding so the gla is the yeah, well, they're the uh, uh, Great London Authority. So that's the body which uh, funds 
or it, 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 it receives uh, central government money and it distributes it effectively among uh, for for what's called affordable housing affordable housing. So as part of their affordable housing um, budget budget which goes over I don't know four years or so. This one is the next one is 2021 to 2026. It's a five year kind of budget and um, so they will set at the beginning of that so the previous one would whatever it is 2016 to 20 whatever and the fundamental change in this uh, 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 this budget is that they are no longer funding mm -hmm. so previously if you if you had a council estate of 100 homes and on that estate they would say let's say uh, two-thirds of them were council homes um well, actually, all if they have council homes and the other was, would be, let's say, leaseholders, and you demolish the whole 100 and you're planning to build 200 homes in their place. Um, the cost of estate generation is, is one of the places where we look at that. So that's also on our, uh, one of the reports that we've done. So of those 100 homes, the GLA would fund um, the building of every new social or affordable home, um, even if it, if it had been demolished. So if you demolish the 100 homes, and if they're all social rented homes, you get £100,000 per towards the building, the rebuilding of that home. It's mm -hmm. quite a significant, not all of it, but it's quite a significant amount of money. Um, they have now announced last December that they will not fund the rebuilding of a demolished home. And I believe, I'd like to believe, I suppose, that that's because they realised that it was both, uh, you know, kind of economically madness. Like, why are we demolishing a home? Unless there are significant, uh, you know, uh, um, um, structural flaws with it, which, again, none of the, none of the buildings we've ever encountered have ever had anything close to any sort of significant uh, projects, uh, reasons for, for, dem for demolishing them. It's complete madness to demolish a perfectly good home um, when you can refurbish it. And so the GLA's removal of that funding I would like to think has come out of, you know, maybe partly to do with a sort of the lobbying and making them realise that it's, 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 it's financial madness for, for let's say, taxpayers' money to be paying to demolish something, which is perfectly good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, that's an economic argument. Um, so, that's, so that's the economic argument which we're making, which is that this is, you know, like the, the Brent has a, has a fiduciary, I think, a fiduciary duty which means they have to they have an obligation to manage the money that they have which is i which is public money they have a duty to manage that efficiently and economically um and we would argue that demolishing a perfectly good home um just to demolish the home on a kind of large council estate you're looking at around fifty thousand pounds demolition you know getting rid of all the waste all that sort of thing to take it to a cleared land mm -hmm. that's the same amount of money it would cost to refurbish that home up to um, good contemporary standards you know and then on top of that you've got to build the new home so you're looking at around another couple of hundred thousand so you know compare it to comparatively again looking at the economic arguments to refurbish a home 50 grand is, you know is a decent amount of money um and you could do an external you know you can cloud it externally uh you know thermally uh, improve the thermal performance all the windows and everything and get something which is up to a contemporary standard external uh, envelope versus what sort of 250 three or four hundred thousand per new build house it doesn't again the, the the figures just don't stack up economically so what we've tried to do i suppose in our in the report you know with st raphael's is not, not not quite as overtly as we did in the book in terms of looking at these different sections but effectively yeah you know we have a quantity surveyor who looks at the sort of economic consequences of our proposals we have an environmental engineer who'll work with us and who will look at specifically at the mm. the embodied carbon and in terms of the social i suppose um we you know we, we spent two years uh working with the residents all that was difficult obviously because of the the lockdown conditions we we had one big meeting last february in 2020 um and then since then it's been much more sporadic um relationships with smaller groups of people um, and we asked residents, you know, what is it that you like most about living in the estate? You know, again, to try and how do you capture the social qualities of an estate? You know, how do you do that? That's something which I suppose a sort of sociologist, um, that's what they do. Um, thinking about how do you capture it? How do you, I mean, I don't want to use the word measure it, but at least how do you represent it in some way? How do you illustrate it? Um, and I think that's really, really important that you, 
that you do because again those things are kind of they're not discussed I and mean, you don't want to discuss something that's going to contradict your argument as an architect going in on a demolition scheme you're not going to talk about the social qualities of the existing estate so one of our um one of the uh, architectural assistants working with us who's an extraordinarily beautiful drawer did these absolutely exquisite sort of uh, sectional perspectives of the existing homes um uh with existing with residents because he met some of the residents when we went to one of the one of the meetings and was really captivated by the story that one of these residents told about the different relationships the social networks that were happening on her street um and so that was a it was a terraced house so she lives in one of the terraced houses in St. Raphael's it's a very mixed estate very sort of five different housing types um so from a from a sort of three to four bed terrace um to a two to three bed maisonette um, to a one bed flats and some bungalows. So there's a really interesting range of different housing types. And the woman that this, the, the assistant, the architectural assistant um, met was telling these fantastic stories about the different, you know, the, the family three doors down and the relationship that she had. She was, she was disabled, disabled mm-hmm. resident and how she'd managed to modify the house to suit her needs because yeah. um, I think originally it had a garage which she had managed to modify into a front room um, and she lived in there, I think there were three generations of a family living in that one house mm-hmm. um, but they also had really really close relationships with all the different people along this little it's quite a short terrace and it's probably about 10 homes along there yeah. and this really kind of um, inspired this this uh, this uh, architect to um, to try and think about how to represent how to draw, how to illustrate these social relations. Mm. Um, and in the end, we did a, he did a series of kind of perspectival collages. It's not collages, sorry, perspectival hand drawings of these um, uh, of the estate through the different housing types. And we asked residents, um, you know, can you give us stories of your experiences of your life on the estate? What you you know what you like about the estate? And, and so we got all these stories from the residents, and we sort of created this. Um, yeah, a drawing which somehow tried to capture the social life of, of the estate. It's a very difficult thing to do, but I think it's something that an architectural kind of student in particular, or an architect, young architect, has those skills to do. Um, and the, the drawings that he's done are absolutely exquisite. And I think the whole, the stories that are told um, are very difficult to argue with because the stories do relate to, to the spaces on the estate, you know um and um so that's in a way like you know the different skills that we have as architects how can they be used um because there's so many different skills representation is a you know it's probably the most powerful skill a tool i think um that the architects have you know mm-hmm. we don't build buildings we design them we effectively we represent things mm-hmm. we make drawings in order to that somebody else will build them and part of that is the storytelling ability um and uh sorry i think i've taken a very long answer to you no i think that's i think that's a it's a really um it's a it's a beautiful kind of um narrative trajectory that you've traced and i think it brings us to a lovely kind of concluding point we're going from the kind of structural issues that underpin a lot of these all the way down to not only the um looking at the voice of the of the community itself but how the architect then um engages with consolidates illustrates that um mm. i think that's really very beautiful um so thank you very much it's been a really fascinating discussion and i'm really okay. grateful um grateful for your time and your insights um yeah great yeah it's been a pleasure it's been lovely to talk about it um obviously the, the report um which is the culmination of those two years work is now available so if people want to kind of have a look at that um That'd be great, and yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, for a socialist architecture, that's a sort of those were the um, uh, the lectures going towards uh, a sort of publication of. I mean, we have published those, and they are you can buy them. <laughs> we put them on Lulu, um, um, but the idea was to it's thinking about getting them published, but um, uh, I don't know. It's not something that we've devoted much time to. Admittedly, I think you know your time gets really focused on the immediate things at hand, and when you're working on a on a particular project. So the St. Raphael's estate, you know, in theory, that the, there's a ballot that's going to be held, 
Yeah, I've but been the on the Brent Council website and they've got yours and they've got the uh, erasure, pl- the, the gentrification plan. Yeah. I mean, so that in theory was meant to happen, you know, in autumn 2021 this year. I think that's now been pushed back because I think, again, following the GLA funding, that will no longer be viable. That's part of what our report is sort of trying to argue that their their scheme is just not is not viable, not environmentally, not economically, not economically, and not socially. So no. we've sent it to uh, to the councillors. We sent the MP. We sent it to you know, talking to the GLA. So let's hope that uh, people start um, start to listen, and let's hope the residents vote to to save their estate. Um, thanks ever that so really, much. really great um, you the conversation. yeah I really enjoyed it well that was spectacular thanks again to Geraldine please check out Geraldine's links in the podcast description Geraldine Denning Architecture and Architects for Social Housing please don't forget to like, subscribe, follow and share everywhere and I look forward to speaking to you next week cheers <laughs>